Well, good morning, Cross Live. Good to see you and welcome to Palm Sunday without palms. <laughs> Just saying, we don't have palms here because we don't want to make the people that are at home feel bad because they don't have palms. Let's be real, that's a crock, to be honest with you. Nothing against you folks at home, we're so glad you're there with us, but that's not why we don't have palms today. The reason we don't have palms today is your pastor um, refused to get help to get those palms picked up and said, oh, I pass by that place all the time, I can pick them up. But my daughter's car broke down and I drove by that place six times that day and I never picked up the palms. So, uh, you know what? We'll pick them up on Monday. I'm hoping you come to the Way of the Cross. They'll be here. Take them when you come. So another incentive to be here is to pick up your palms for Palm Sunday and Passion Week, and uh, we're glad you're here today. Well, I I'm excited about Palm Sunday. I'm excited about Easter around the corner. I'm excited about the Way of the Cross and, and our time here in Holy Week coming up and the service on Thursday. I'm also excited about the fact that we are finishing up Daniel. Not that I want to finish it per se, but that, you know what, we are, we're going to be having our last sermon in Daniel today, and we're going to be looking at another couple really important lessons that God wants to teach us. Let me just review some of the other lessons we have learned. We have learned that God is in control of absolutely everything. He is. He's in complete control. No matter how crazy it looks, he's in control. Also, we know that we have a God of the impossible. It's not po possible with me sometimes, but you know what? It's possible with God, exactly. So we're learning that lesson. We also learned that, you know what, when we need to, to, something from God, we need to gather our friends together. We need to pray. We need to praise him and be prepared to God to answer those prayers. We also learned that, you know what, God expects us to pursue holiness, pursue a relationship with him, pursue the things that he teaches us that he wants us to do, okay, and so we can be strong in doing them and not compromise when that well, that voice of compromise hits us, right? Finding also someone that can be your iron, sharpening iron person, that person that can take time to build you up, maybe that mentor, that other person that builds you up spiritually so when those times come that we're called to compromise, you can stand strong because you've been iron, sharpening iron. And so those are just some of the great lessons that we've learned so far. And each one of those lessons, to be quite frankly, are extremely relative into our day today because today, you know what? Everything's changing. Things are changing faster than we can imagine. God's principles are getting pushed out of the way, uh, to be quite honest with you, and our call to compromise, to rationalize away our own faith, well, that call just keeps getting louder and louder, doesn't it? does. And so we need these lessons from Daniel. And so we got a couple more today. Well, I want to talk about probably the most familiar Bible story to anybody. Even if you didn't hear it in Sunday school multiple times, you probably heard about this story. You know the story, Daniel and the lion's den, right? Everybody's kind of heard about that cute little children's story. But to be quite honest, it's not that cute a children's story, to be honest with you. Uh, and we'll learn some very incredible lessons today. In fact, I've never preached this passage ever, so I'm kind of excited about it. Well, if you don't know the history of Daniel, you're, you're, you're not too sure who Daniel is. Daniel was a prophet of the Old Testament. Uh, basically, he was about 13 to 15 years old when a king named Nebuchadnezzar came into his country or his city of Jerusalem, ransacked the city, and took all the smartest noble kids out of the city and took them to Babylon, put them in Babylon University, said, you're going to study for three years and you're going to be working for me. That was Daniel. That was his life. And so I also told you earlier that there's essentially two distinct breakdowns in the book of Daniel. Essentially, chapters 1 through 6 were life story of Daniel. 7 through 12 are the prayers and the prophetic visions that he got during that time. And so we find ourselves in chapter 6 today. So if you have your Bibles there, please open them up there and look at chapter 6. We'll be going through that entire chapter. And we find out, actually, that Daniel is probably about 85 years old at this time. And what's really cool about this is Daniel's working. <laughs> he's still working at 85 years old. And he's not just a greeter at Walmart. <laughs> 
He is going to be raised up to be the second in command of this empire. He, he's essentially going to be the VP. And, and so, you know what? There, I just realized there's hope for me. <laughs> I'm just getting started, folks. Look out. So, well, we'll see about that. <laughs> we'll see. But uh, I think that's just kind of maybe one of the, another, one of the miracles we see in this text, in, in this book. Uh, so, but what we begin to see is at, by this time, Nebuchadnezzar is long gone. But the dream that, that Daniel interpreted back in chapter 2, if you remember, was about a statue that Nebuchadnezzar dreamed about. The top of the statue was a head of gold, which actually Daniel told him, that's you, you're that kingdom. The next kingdom was a, uh, the torso and the arms of the statue, which were made out of silver, which actually is now come into fruition. And this is the empire that has taken over, the Medes and the Persians. Essentially, it was kind of a co-empire that took place during that time. And so we see, again, Daniel's prophecy coming true here. If you want to learn what happens and how that transition happens, we skip chapters 4 and 5, go back and read them. They're really, really cool also. But essentially, there's two kings that rule this time in this region. One is King Darius of the Medes and King Cyrus of Persia. And we're going to be dealing more with, da with Darius today, and uh, essentially Cyrus kind of takes more control later on. We actually see his name show up in the book of Ezra, in the book of Nehemiah, when the, when the Jewish people are released back to Jerusalem. So I want to take, if I can, the same approach I took last week, and that is I'm going to tell the story, I'm going to pull out some of the very important verses that can help us understand what's going on, and then we're going to take some time to learn some application, both from uh, Daniel and from, I think, God's perspective, and things that we can literally apply to our life when we walk out of this place. Do you want to do that? You want to do that? Good, good. I hope you do. And you know what? That means right now is story time. Who wants to hear a story? Say amen. Yeah, you want to hear a story. All right. So let me tell you this cool story about Daniel and the lion's den. When the story opens up, we find out that Daniel uh, is very respected by this King Darius. And he's going to raise him up. Apparently, Daniel was one of three governors uh, that ruled in the area by that time. And he's going to get raised up to be second in command. The other guys, the other governors and the, the men that they call uh, satraps, uh, they didn't quite like that so much. Well, we also find out that in Daniel it says about him that he is an excellent spirit in him, he, that he has an excellent spirit in him. Hmm. Pretty significant to have the Bible say you have an excellent spirit in you, and Daniel does, and well, it didn't seem to go too well with the, the satraps and all those guys because they didn't want Daniel to be, uh, be, the king, or be the second in command. There was about 120 of these guys, and they were, the satrap was essentially a, um, a, um, a governor or a ruler of such that were responsible for security and essentially collecting taxes in the area, in the kingdom. So... Now, I told you a couple weeks ago that Daniel was one of the Bible characters that literally almost nothing negative is ever said about Daniel. Nothing. In fact, he's, he's close to uh, the, as a biblical human uh, as you can get to a perfect human, which he wasn't perfect either. But uh, again, nothing said about him. And, but the leaders, again, they didn't like him for whatever reason uh, because he was probably an outsider, and we all know about that. But it says there in chapter or verse 4, it says, And the high officials and the satraps sought to find a ground to complain against Daniel with regards to the kingdom. But they found no ground for complaint or any fault because he was faithful. And no error or fault was found in Daniel, in him. They, these guys... I mean, political stuff went on back then, too. These guys were trying to dig up any little bit of dirt on Daniel, and they came up with nothing. Nothing. And they weren't like the, the, the politicians today that just make up stuff about the other guys. Yeah, I said that, and I went there. <laughs> but they didn't do that back then. Now, now, these governors didn't want to try to find something they could trap him in. And they knew Daniel was a religious man, and and they thought, well, maybe we can use this, his religion against him in some way. 
You know, he's really, he's really faithful to pray, to pray all the time, three times a day even. Maybe, maybe that's his weakness. That's, maybe that's the thing we can exploit on him. You see, that's what people have been doing to Christianity for years, Try, trying to find a ways to, to put it down or to exploit what we do. It was Nietzsche that proclaimed, God is dead, God is dead. Then he was killed and he died. Christianity lived on. How about Voltaire? He exclaimed that, that the Bible would be abandoned in his day and time. Well, you know what? He died and he was abandoned. The Bible still lives on. Amen? You see, these things, these attacks, these things have been going on for years. This is nothing new under the sun, by the way, folks, what we think we are experiencing. There were, they were right. Daniel prayed. He prayed a lot. <laughs> he was very faithful to pray, but the truth was that wasn't his weakness. We're going to find out that that was his strength, right? Well, these governors, these satraps, they were able to convince the king in, I think, a moment of pride and arrogance that, you know what? Hey, king, we need to take a special time of tribute for you so that nobody prays to any god or any other person or anything like that for 30 days. Everybody has to pray for you. And the king, for whatever reason, thought, well, hey, that's a good idea. So like I said, a moment of weakness, a moment of pride slips in, and he makes this edict, and he signs the thing. Well, you got to find out what Daniel does. Verse 10. <laughs> Daniel knew that the document had been signed. He went to his house where he had a window in his upper chamber, and he opened the window towards Jerusalem, and he got down on his knees three times a day, and he prayed, giving thanks before God, just like he had previously done. Hmm. He knew he was going to be breaking the law, but he did it anyway. Hmm. He didn't hide behind a closed curtain. Now, some people would say, well, he was 85 years old. He was just a crotchy old man. He was going to do what he wants to do, right? Well, maybe. Maybe. But I think there was a little more depth to who Daniel was and why he did what he did. The officials had set Daniel up, didn't they? And Daniel took the bait. And the Bible says they found him, the satraps and the governors, they found him making prayer and supplication to his God. Hmm. It's interesting that Daniel, the Bible says he faced Jerusalem. Uh, this is kind of significant because I think Daniel knew exactly what took place or the writings that were recorded when King Solomon was dedicating the temple, and he wrote about times like this that would come. Listen to what it says in verse 44. It says, if your people go out to battle against their enemy by whatever way you shall send them, they pray to the Lord towards the city that which I have chosen and the house which I have built for his name. Solomon built the temple and he's saying, look, they go out to, you go out to war, I want you to turn and face uh, Jerusalem and pray. Jump over to verse 48, very interesting as well. He says, if they repent with all their mind and with all their heart in the land that their enemies who have carried them captive and pray towards their land which I gave to their fathers, the city that was chosen and the house that I built for their name. Hundreds of years before, Solomon writes this at the dedication of the temple and says, you know what? If history comes down to it and we get put captive somewhere, I want our people to face Jerusalem and pray towards this city. Wow. Wow. I think that's exactly what Daniel was doing. But it also begs the question, what, what was Daniel actually praying about? Do we have any idea? In the fact, we do. Daniel, in chapter 9, records a prayer. It's probably one of the most repentive, most 
uh, expressive, confessional-based biblical prayer that you'll ever, ever read. I encourage you to go there. Chapter 9, verses 1 through 19. We're not going to read it today, but we understand in that that essentially he's praying. I think he's longing for his childhood days, days back when in Jerusalem, at that point in time, they were worshiping God. They were in God's favor. It was a wonderful time. And I think Daniel's longing for that and asking for God to get them back there. And the truth is, he, God never answers that prayer for Daniel. Daniel never goes back to Jerusalem. So the officials go, and they do their tattletaling to the king, right? Ah, we're going to tell on Daniel. And what happens is, actually, they tell the king, and the king is distraught. He is highly upset. And the thing is, he could not change his own law. And so he knew he was going to have to take his number two man, the man he respected the most in the kingdom, and throw him into a lion's den. And normally that doesn't go well, just to let you know. Remember the king, like I said, he liked Daniel quite a bit. Listen to what the king says. It says, The king commanded that Daniel was brought and cast into the lion's den, And the king declared to Daniel, may your God, whom you serve continually, deliver you. We have a pagan king essentially praying for Daniel, praying to his God, say, man, get your God to save you, because I don't want you to die. Amazing. Amazing to see something like that. The king that night, After Daniel got thrown in there, he couldn't sleep. Couldn't sleep a wink. Ever ever been there, been so worried that you couldn't, you stayed awake all night just to worry? Well, this is is what the king was doing. It it basically says he didn't take any entertainment. And so if the Super Bowl was on or March Madness was on or the MLB playoffs, no, he wasn't watching any of that. Dude, he was upset, highly, highly upset. And what we also see is what we talked about last week. If you remember last week, uh, he, he is now getting in his own little fiery furnace, isn't he? And so I told you there's three scenarios that happen. You get, you get delivered from, okay? You don't, you don't end up going into it, right? Or you get delivered through, and this is what's happened in Daniel, scenario number two. You get one through the fiery furnace in the lion's den, or you get delivered by We we hope that doesn't happen. We hope he doesn't get eaten and taken to Jesus. But the king comes down the very next morning. And and I love what the king says here. (laughs) He says, then Daniel, uh, or what Daniel says to the king, O king, live forever. Uh, May God send his angel, my God sent his angel and shut the mouths of the lion. They have not harmed me because I was found blameless before him. Also before you, O king, I have done no harm. Daniel's like, I'm all right. (laughs) I'm good. God saved me. He also says that I'm blameless, which when I read that, I'm like, is he being a little arrogant here? I mean, who goes around? I don't really go around saying, I know I'm forgiven and I'm cleansed and I'm washed with the blood of Jesus, but I don't really go around saying I'm blameless. And he does that. But I believe it, he says that not out of arrogance. I think he says it because he has known time after time in his life where God has essentially rescued him, that he has been faithful and God has blessed his faithfulness. You remember what the word or the name Daniel actually means? It means God is my judge. That's what his name means. And so I think he understood that completely and understood that when he did serve God, it was just an affirmation to see that he would get saved. I I love what the king then says. It says, the king was was exceedingly glad and commanded that Daniel be taken out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no uh, no kind of harm was found on him because... He had trusted in God. You see, it was Daniel's faith that saved him, right? Isn't it the same for you and I? Isn't it our, sa- our faith that saves us, our belief and our trust in, in an all-knowing, all-loving, all-providing God that forgives us to the nth degree? That's, 
where we find our salvation and our rescue and our being saved. Can you say amen to that? Yeah. In faith. Two things end up happening to the, or two things happen here at the end, here. The pagan king, Darius, basically writes a, a decree that is unbelievable, and we're going to look at that in just a minute, a decree about Daniel's God. And then the satraps and the rest of these governors and folks that plan this thing, well, this is where the story doesn't get real children-like. They get thrown in to the lion's den. And it literally talks about how the lions crushed their bones. But it isn't, wasn't just them. It was them and their families, their children. And now while that sounds very harsh to you and I, it was the way of the day. When, it, when, you, it, when anybody observed the, the, the authority of the king, his entire family was wiped out because they didn't want people coming back later on and trying to excite revenge. And so they would kill entire families. If you messed up, your whole family was, was done. So let's draw a couple lessons today, a couple lessons and some applications. The first one's, I think, a lesson that Daniel wants us to know. And it goes like this. Your faithful, intimate relationship with God will produce in you a fearless, non-compromising obedience. A fearless, non compromising obedience that comes from this intimate relationship we have with God. The application is really quite simple. You know what? I want somebody to accuse you of praying. <laughs> Have you ever been accused of praying too much? Raise your hand. Not many. I think one or twice maybe somebody said something like that to me. But Daniel, <laughs> he's kind of accused of, of praying too much. His holy habit was to pray literally three times a day. Remember we started out this year? Pray first, right? Still wearing your bracelets? A couple there? Good, good, good. Awesome. Keep that in mind. We're to pray first. We're supposed to be guilty of praying to our God. Do we have to face Jerusalem? No, not anymore. Okay? We have Jesus. Okay? Because remember, he is at the right hand of the Father. Okay, he is there interceding for us, the Bible tells us, and so we can lift our arms and our hands up. We can bow our heads. However we do it, we can turn east, west, right, or wherever. Jesus is everywhere, and we can pray that way. And the thing about it is God, he, God wants us to pray about everything, though, right? Everything. I, I love what Paul says. You all know this verse, Philippians 4, 6. And seven, do not be anxious for anything, but in everything, and if you haven't ever unlined, highlighted that word in your Bible, okay, do it on your phone, Bible too, highlight everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. So important. And then the peace of God that surpasses the understanding, guards our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Pray about everything in your life. Pray about the physical illnesses. Pray about the, the, the mental illnesses. Pray about sexual problems. Pray about relational problems. Pray about everything. That's what God calls us to do, to pray about everything, to be guilty of prayer. And not without thanksgiving. In fact, if we go back into Daniel's text here, if you read back early, it talks about that, that Daniel was essentially praying three times a day, giving thanks to God even when the circumstances are bad. Like today when I realized I forgot the palms. So I went into prayer meeting, I prayed. <laughs> Giving thanks that we even have church. <laughs> but you understand, we pray in everything. and everything. And let me tell you this, there's a real easy, cool, wonderful, practical way to get this thing started. There isn't a better time in your life to, to be accused of praying too much, and we have an offering to do that to you here. Come sometime this week. The church is open from 9 to 4 during the day. Wednesday we have extra hours to do this, but come and experience the way of the cross. It is a self-guided time of prayer. I encourage you, encourage you, encourage you. There isn't a better time of the year than Holy Week to start being accused of praying. Amen? Amen. So please, we'd love to see you those days. 
Well, Daniel's lesson there, we're praying, we're building this intimate relationship with God, and what I'm telling you is when you have that intimate relationship with God, you begin to know and have the strength not to compromise. It's, we see it in Daniel's life. We can see it in our own lives when we start getting accused of praying. Well, I think God has a lesson for us as well today. And the God lesson goes like this. Our faithfulness and trust in God impacts the unbelieving world for God's glory. Our faithfulness, our trust in God impacts the unbelieving world for God's glory. Truly, truly an amazing thought. We certainly see it in this text. In fact, let's look at how it impacted literally this, the king of this empire. The decree that is written there, and starting in verse 25, it says, And King Darius wrote to all the peoples, nations, and languages that dwelled on the earth, Peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in all my royal dominion, people are to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. He, for he is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom will never be destroyed, and his dominion will never end. I don't know how he knows so much about our God, but he does, and he's making a national decree about it. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. He, he who has saved Daniel from the power of the lions. Man. I mean, think about that for a minute. A pagan king writing this about our God. Talk about impact to an unbelieving world. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we can do that. Uh, I'll tell you a story, and I'm not trying to brag on myself, but it was a story back, and some of you have heard this before, but when I went to seminary, I, I worked at a hospital, and I was supposed to be in that job for one year, and... The year came up, and I basically handed my boss my resignation, and my boss handed me, handed me my 10-year anniversary pin or whatever they gave me and pushed back my resignation and said, what do you need to do? I said, well, I can only work three days anymore. i got to focus on my schooling because I was going to seminary at the time. And my boss, who was, to my knowledge, not a believer, he never really was, you know, talked, we talked a little bit around that, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't have said he was a believer. He said, what do you need? I said, three days. He comes back to me and says, look, we're going to charge the client of this hospital only one day for your services. We're going to eat the other two days ourselves, and we're going to provide you health care. Yeah. <laughs> Let me tell you something. I don't know this for a fact, but I do know the system. Uh, that went into the bottom line of the PC in that, the profit in that account. That also affected his bonuses. I know that. Whether he made it up somewhere else, I don't know. But all I know is I was able to find favor with an unbeliever. When we trust God and we've been praying to God, let me tell you, we start impacting the unbelieving world around us. I know sometimes it's hard to see that or believe that, but it does, and it is happening. Daniel's faithfulness essentially impacted King Darius, of course, and actually goes on. We're pretty sure that it impacted King Cyrus, because, again, King Cyrus was the next king in line. Essentially, he took command, and in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, the Jews are released to go back and build their temple and build a wall around their city. And in all this, I believe, had to do with Daniel. And the fact that this guy was praying and had this intimate relationship with God. So here's the application, and this is not simple, folks, and I'll explain it. I want you to say, I will stand up with God when he calls me. When he calls me. To. When he calls me to stand up. That begs the question, when does God call us to stand up, to stand strong, to make the choice to 
not follow man's laws, but follow God's laws. Truth is, in Western Christianity, which is the United States, basically, we exercise extreme freedoms when it comes to religion compared to the rest of the world. We can openly have church anywhere we want, pretty much. We can create uh, and have religious schools. We can have protests against certain things or things. Uh, around the globe, that's not the same. So I want you to take for an instance what took place years ago, but still always talked about, the removal of prayer from the public schools. As much as I would love to see prayer back in the public school, um, that's not the same situation Daniel was facing. It's not apples to apples. You see, Daniel wasn't forbidden to pray in the palace courtyard. He was forbidden to pray at all, anywhere, anytime. And if he did pray, he had to pray to a pagan king, an idol. So he was forbidden to pray essentially at all. I mean, think about it. Do you, you think Daniel would have protested? To, uh, oh, I really want to pray in the middle of my divination class. No, I don't think that's what Daniel was or would have done. Again, when these questions come up, when do I stand? We need to be, like I said before, and Jesus said, we need to be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Where we find similar situations in our own life maybe sometimes is maybe it's a, a work relationship. Maybe you are being harassed or maybe you lose your job because on your lunchtime you study the Bible, you pray. And your boss doesn't like that. Compromising your freedom. Maybe it has to do with a relationship, a husband or wife relationship, and one isn't a believer in the others, and the other one says, you can't, I don't want to see any of your Christianity in my face. Tough situations. Where do we compromise? Where do we say it's God's law? I have to not compromise God's law. What's interesting is that when Daniel heard about the change, you know, he didn't go rally a, a group of people and start protesting and marching around Babylon, did he? No, no. What, what, what he did do was this. He obeyed God, and literally he prepared to die. He obeyed God and prepared to die. I don't know who made this quote, but it is spot on, it says this, Christians do not fight for belief by assaulting or killing, but by dying. They don't fight for their beliefs because of assaulting or killing, but they fight by dying. Pre-reformer John Huss, 1514, burned at the stake because he protested against the Catholic Church use of indulgences. And essentially, if you don't know what an indulgence is, it was basically by yourself and your relatives freedom from sin. William Tyndale, 1536, killed for translating the Bible into English. What a terrible guy. But he was burned at the stake. The New Testament tells us. Chapter 5, the book of Acts. Peter and the apostles are in the temple, and they're, they're healing people. <laughs> and they're saying it's in the name of Jesus. And so they get thrown in jail for this. And, you know, God, being God, is like, all right, angel, get them out. Unhook this thing. They're gone. And you know where they go the next day? <laughs> right back to the temple. <laughs> but this time, the leaders were like, uh, the crowd is pretty much on their side we can't throw them back in jail, but let's call them over here, and we're going to tell them, hey, guys, no more healing here. No more saying it's in the name of Jesus. Can't have you doing that, guys. And their response, well, <laughs> we must obey God rather than men. There's times we have to say we must obey God rather than men. Jesus told us this also 
He said, do not fear those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both the soul and the body in hell. Hmm. That's who we should be careful around. What about our present day? Many of you have probably seen the news and the headlines about a church in Baltimore who uh, ignored any and all protocols for COVID safety and did their own thing. Didn't social distance, didn't mask, didn't stop singing, didn't do anything. They just did their thing and went on. The authorities found out about it. They said, look, you're shut down. Well, you can't do church. You know what they did? They had church. Now, hmm, should they take a stand? Personally, you all know, because you're in the church here, you know that I didn't quite take that same stand. I said, look, am I compromising God's call for us to worship together? Yeah, I know for a few weeks we were, we were just doing this thing online, and it was weird, just two or three people in here. <laughs> But the message of encouragement, the prayer, all that worship and stuff was going out. So I didn't feel like we were compromising. Then we were able to gather a little more. We gathered outside, and then we finally got in here, and we're still wearing masks. Still trying not to sing too loud when we sing. And the reason for me, and hopefully for you, is, you know what? I don't feel like we're compromising by making these adjustments, especially even in the early days. I I hated it, and if it went on a bit longer, maybe I would have thought about it a little bit more. Was I compromising? The other reason we do all this masking and distancing and all this other stuff is because we want to show mercy to the people that could potentially get this disease and die because people are dying from this. But we show mercy. In fact, the signs we have, the few signs we do have, it says, show love and respect. That's why we do it. Jesus said this, Matthew 12, and if you had known what it means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. You would have not condemned the guiltless. God desires mercy (laughs) before sacrifice. Let me ask you a question. You think that church in Baltimore has impacted the unbelieving world positively in any way? I don't think so. Will the unbelieving world write decrees and praise God because of their stance and the way they took their stance? I don't think so. But we can impact the world for Jesus. When we do and are wise as serpents and innocent as doves about the times when God tells us to make a stand. And I know these things are, and these times are hard to figure out. But the th- truth is you need to be on rock-solid biblical ground so you better know your scriptures and you better be in prayer about when and where you make your stand. It's time. It's time for the church to make an impact around the world. And right here. The story of salvation is really all through Daniel. How God saves him through fiery furnaces and taking a stand on eating and in the lion's den. Salvation comes the same way. By faith by trusting in God's gift. It's also very interesting uh, that we look back at Daniel and we see incredible similarities between Daniel, okay, and Jesus. It's actually quite interesting. 
Jesus and Daniel were both framed with false circumstances, weren't they? Jesus and Daniel were both arrested while they were praying. Pilate, like Darius, wanted to release him, but the enemy's plans moved forward. They were both turned over to be executed. Where the storyline changes is that when Daniel comes forth without a scratch, he comes forth with miraculous salvation. With Jesus, he dies, but he emerges out of the tomb three days later alive. Can I hear an amen? Yeah. Daniel's story demonstrates God's ability to overrule evil to bring about something good. Jesus' story demonstrates God's ability to rule over evil to bring about salvation to the world, literally to the world. Both have everything to do with trusting in God. It is your faith in God's supreme act of love that gives you freedom from your sin and an everlasting life. This faith we talk about is personal. It's not about religion and it's not about what you do per se. It is about the intimate love that God has for each one of us. It's not just about a night with God. It's about an eternity with God. So today, Today, if God has spoken to you in some way, shape, or form, if God has said, you know what, are you saying, I, I think maybe I can believe. Maybe I have enough faith. The Bible says you need a faith of a mustard seed. And you can believe and you can trust, and God will grow that. My hope and prayer for you is that you ask God to be your Savior. You pray something like this, Father God, thank you. I never thought I could be saved, never imagined I could be saved. I didn't even know I needed to be saved, but I do realize that, yeah, <laughs> I do things wrong and that this world was created by a perfect God. And this perfect God In perfect timing, sent his son Jesus to die on the cross, take the punishment for our sins, raise from the dead, and promise everlasting life. I don't know this perfectly. I don't understand it perfectly, but I am going to trust in you because I know I need, I need you. If that's your prayer, welcome to the kingdom of God. <laughs> really. Welcome to the kingdom of God. And if that is your prayer, I want you to respond in a couple ways. And if you're online, just go online. Hit a connect card. Let us know about your decision. If you're here, you can do it online too. Just go on your phone and say, yeah, I, I, I'm trusting in Jesus. And if you've done that, the next step you, you take literally is baptism. To be baptized into the family of God that way. So we pray that you would respond that way, or if God is talking to you about being a member or what we call a partner in this church, let us know. Respond either here through your communication card on your bulletin or online. Just don't let this moment pass. Now, before we turn it over to the band, and I know you're all anxious and I want to sing one more song out with you, uh, Easter's coming next week, right? And I suspect we will have more people here, and we're not running two services. So I'm going to need our people, and if you're online and you plan on coming, listen up. I, want, I need our people to do a couple things. Number one, if you can, uh, our band parks on the side of the building and fills that up, but park in the back, and we'll have people directing you if there's free spaces in the back. Okay? We want to leave as much parking out front for any guests that come. And if you're like my family, sometimes we bring like four cars. 
Because everybody comes step, yeah. Um, don't do that. Please plan accordingly to limit the number of cars if you can do that. Also, if I look at this seating chart here, it's much heavier over here. Now, we want to make it easier for people that come and, and maybe they come a little bit late, and sometimes guests do that even on Easter. So I'm going to ask you to fill up the front row and fill up that side first, okay? It will be arranged a little bit differently, but uh, fill that size up so when people do come that they have more ease of access to seating and we can help them seat uh, easier. And if it does get so crowded, um, we may ask a couple people to give up their seat and view the, the service online in the lobby. So we're praying for God to do a, a wonderful and miraculous thing this week through the way of the cross. So again, don't forget about that and the service on Thursday. Uh, but I know uh, this is the kind of church that just wants to make sure people are and feel welcome uh, and that Jesus is here for them as well. So uh, invite, invite, invite. We have opportunity.